Welcome to Category 5 Technology TV. This week, we're going to be looking at the Raspberry Pi, but we're going to be doing it from a different perspective. We're going to be connecting the GPIO, and we're learning how to turn on and off a light. Yes. But we're going to program it so that that light turns on when Category 5 Technology TV is on the air, which we are right, right now. now. Right now. So stick so around. Should be on. Yes. After this show. Don't go anywhere. This is Category 5 Technology TV. Our live recordings are trusted only to solid state drives by Kingston Technology. Revive your computer with improved performance and reliability over traditional hard drives with Kingston SSDs. Category 5 TV streams live with Telestream Wirecast and Nimble Streamer. Tune in every week on Roku, Kodi, Plex, and other HLS video players. For local showtimes, visit Category5.tv. Category5.tv is a member of the Tech Podcast Network. If it's tech, it's here. Cat5.tv slash TPN and the International Association of Internet Broadcasters. Cat5.tv slash IAIB. Welcome to the show, everybody. Nice to have you here for episode number 596. We are four weeks away from episode 600. That's amazing. That what are we going to do? What are we going to do? I don't know. Something with sixes? Uh, Any ideas? What can we do? That, I don't know. Yeah. Maybe bring some cake or some pie. Maybe oh, we could bring raspberry some raspberry pie. Yeah. <gasps> That Six sounds like them. a plan. I demand. 600 That's of two them. raspberry pies. E oh, 600. That's a lot of baking. That, that Your wife we is can good just at baking. Cut. She's can. great at baking. So, oh. hey, Jen. Guess what? You have been nominated for 600 raspberry pies. And I also think, a pizza. And I all of our friends are invited. the nomination <laughs> due to time constraints. <laughs> wow. Hard to believe that we're almost there. That's oh, unbelievable. No. Did you ever think you'd reach 600? Well, I never ever even contemplated... Yeah, it's just, you're, yeah, you're you're, just we're like here that. every week, every single week. Well, you are. I am. I'm not. Yeah, you're not. <laughs> Super happy you're here this <laughs> Oh, look, Jeff is here. I feel like I'm a guest at this point. <clears throat> yeah, I had yeah. to rearrange all the cameras uh, yeah. in order to accommodate the fact that Jeff was actually here tonight. Mm hmm um, I just want to say thank you very, very much to everyone who has thus far pitched in to uh, support the replacing of our, our uh, Wirecast broadcast server. It's a powerful kind of gaming rig computer that all of our cameras connect into, and it allows us to do the camera switching and the graphics that you see on the screen and Discord over there and everything else. It's basically our... our Everything plugs into that, and it produces right. the show. Um, but it's been dying, and it's been having some trouble, and we talked about it uh, briefly last week. Right. And um, some people didn't quite get why we were asking for help. Um, and so just a reminder, and, and maybe some of you don't even realize that Category 5, as we mentioned, has been here for 600 weeks almost. Right. Yeah. But we do this as volunteers. We are volunteers. The studio is a rented space, mm -hmm. so we have to pay for that space. We have to pay for all the bills, um, and when something happens like a server dying, um, that's not really, you know, we don't have money in the bank to say, let's just go and buy a new server. Mm -hmm. It doesn't work that way when you're a voluntary organization such as this, that, uh, you know, we keep keep the lights on and keep the show going every single week, um, but, um, but we do this as volunteers, and we need to be able to um, afford to replace that <laughs> old girl. She's she served us well. Fairly imminently. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. It's like we got to do this like yesterday. So hopefully tonight will go well. Technically, um, last week went fairly well after the show. It's the kind of the post production that's a real problem. Um, during the live is pretty good because we're recording to an external recorder, so we don't have to really use a lot of CPU resources right. and and, uh, and the bus itself in order to uh, to do that. So. Thank you to mm -hmm. everyone who has contributed towards that. Also to our patrons, uh, we appreciate you. These are the folks who give as little as $1 per month. And there's no upper cap, folks. Hey, $1,000 a month, that's fine. That's fine. We won't say no. No, no <laughs> definitely not. Um, you know, a lot of folks just, you know, pitch in a, a buck a month, mm -hmm. and that makes a huge difference. Mm -hmm. It really does. Like, I joke about a thousand bucks a month. No, that's unreal. Like, that's ridiculous. Yeah. That's just, like, unreal. Be slightly uncomfortable, yeah, actually. Yeah, I, yeah, I don't be know very what awkward. we would do. You own the place, <laughs> uh, so welcome, boss. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but, um, the, you know, when, when there's a lot of folks contributing just a little bit, it really makes a difference yeah. because there's power in that many people giving, and, and that keeps us afloat and keeps the monthly bills paid. Mm -hmm. um, okay. 
Enough of that. Moving on to the Kingston Data Traveler DT2000. Oh, yeah. This is that encrypted um, USB flash drive. We love these here. Uh, we've shown them on the show. It's starting to get some buzz on YouTube, and they are really, really excellent. Mm -hmm. uh, we've got some of these to give away. You can look below if you're watching this on YouTube or on our website, Category5.tv, for the way that you can qualify to win one of these. Um, make sure you, uh, if you're watching this on cable TV or otherwise, uh, if you're watching this on Roku, obviously you can't look below. Um, just head on over to our website, Category5.tv. Find episode number 596, and you'll find the information about how you can qualify to win one of those. And it good does. luck to you. Mm -hmm. um, tonight, uh, now we were talking about raspberry pies. There's yes. no, there's no edibles here tonight. However, we do have a raspberry pie set up and ready to go. We're going to be tinkering with the GPIO in just a couple of moments' time. Stick around. For a limited time, get your hands on limited edition shirts from the Category 5 TV network. These high quality shirts are manufactured by Teespring, a fundraising website, and your purchase will help support the shows we produce. Get yours today and send us your pictures to be featured on the corresponding show. Visit cat5.tv slash shirts to support us and get your official network shirt today. cat5.tv slash shirts. And we're back, so glad you're here, Category 5 Technology TV. Lots of good stuff coming up, but before we get there, I believe there's something with Sasha getting documents online we were talking about before. Past couple of weeks? Yes. Yeah, we were talking. I can give you a bit of a recap of what Please I was Please do, to do because okay. I've missed things. Okay, so I want an update. Cole's notes. <laughs> Cole's notes. I work in an office that has some Windows-based computers, some Linux-based computers. I wanted yes. to be able to open on my computer um, using the new uh, Office Online tool. Okay. I wanted to be able to open or some tool or some tool. Um, open documents on my computer so that the format wouldn't be all mixed mashed up the way it is when I just open it in Libre. Right. Okay. Yes. I have that issue all the time. <clears throat> right. Oh, good. Then yeah. this will help you. Oh, phew. Okay. Yeah, so we looked at... Because one of my laptops is all, it's all Libre Office. Yeah. It's, it's, it's Linux based. And so often I get Word files sent and I open them up. I'm like, oh, formatting. Mm. Right. And that's a tough thing because that can be any number of things. Fonts that yes. the user used and they didn't tag the file. So when you open it, you don't have the same fonts. And so it's all messed up. So mm -hmm. you've got to figure out what fonts they used and install those fonts in yes. order to open them properly. Sometimes people don't realize that, hey, if I create a file on my computer, it's not going to translate when you send it over. So there's no solution to that beyond fixing the file. Correct. Plain and simple. So that's, not a, that's not a LibreOffice problem. No, but that's fine if it's one page. Right. If you get something that's, say, oh, 50 sure. pages, yeah, it's yeah, like, yeah. Oh. <clears throat> But typically, with a document, it's going to be like uh, a generic font that you yeah. can substitute another serif font or something like that. Wingdings. <laughs> yeah, for the whole document. <laughs> That's right. It's a script. Um, but so the, the problem lies in the fact that files are not tagged, so the fonts are not in included with the file. You have to have that font installed. That's one right. good example. Um, that's why PDFs are so popular. Mm -hmm. right. Portable okay. document format. So when Adobe, um, uh, was it? Yeah, I guess it was Adobe that, that did PDF. And they, they created a format that's not typically editable, right? but it looks the same from computer to computer to computer, and that's why it's done so well on the web, because it always opens the same. So if you create the document on your computer, mm -hmm. and then you export it to a PDF file, you can then send it to someone, and they will be able to print it, and it will always look perfect. Right. Yes. That's why we do PDF. That makes sense. If you then take that doc file, or uh, uh, ODT file, mm -hmm. and send them that file, they may be able to open it, but it's probably not going to look the same. It's going to look a little wonky. Mm -hmm. So understand the reasoning, the underlying problem that exists there. Mm -hmm. So I suggested why not look at Google Drive, Google Docs, yep. or now Microsoft Office Online, which is available for free. Mm -hmm. When did it go free? What's Microsoft doing? 
Go to cat5.tv slash msoffice. You'll be able to just sign in with your Skype account or you can create uh, mm -hmm. an account using your email address, really? whatever you want to do. Yeah. yeah. So let's take a quick look at oh. how this is going to translate. So I've created the world's easiest font using a Liberation Serif font, uh, easiest doc. So I'm, I've saved this as a docx. You see the file name in the top left? Yes. So I just went file, save as, and I've saved it as Word format. So understand what I'm doing here is just demonstrating that it will work with doc files. Right. So I don't have to convert them or, or do anything fancy. I'm, I'm, just gonna, I'm just starting with this very, very basic doc file, okay? Save. So now, jumping back to my browser, I have Google Drive and I have Microsoft's OneDrive, which does provide free space up to a limit, just like Google Drive, mm -hmm. and then you can pay if you want more space. Right. So remember last week, we took a look at this just really briefly on the fly, and we didn't really know how to open a file in MS Office Online because we, didn't, we couldn't find the connection. Right. I thought it might be OneDrive, but it was just putting me through this loop of click here, click here, click here. It turns out it's because when I created my account to be able to access MS Office Online, uh -huh. I didn't verify my email address. It sent me an email oh. that said click here to verify your email address, and I didn't do that. That's why last week it was going through this loop of you're not verified, you're not verified, you oh. can't, so I couldn't get in. Right. So okay. it was a little bit sense. of a headache. So I clicked on the verify, and boom, lo and behold, now, Office Online, so if I go cat5.tv slash msoffice, and I open Word, so there's Microsoft Word, it's free Office Online apps, click on Word, then at the bottom here, open from OneDrive, and now it just takes me to my OneDrive. So that's very similar to Google Drive. Right. right. So I'm going to show you both. So I'm going to go New, File Upload, keep in mind now I'm on Google Drive, so this is Google's product, we're going to look at both Google and Microsoft, okay? Because okay. both of these allow you to collaborate. On my desktop, I've got that file. It's going to be the only docx. There it is. Test local file. Upload to Google Docs. It sees the docx at the bottom right, and it's removed the file extension, and it's there. Now, go over to Microsoft's OneDrive, and let's see how we upload to this. Hmm, maybe over here? No. Not quite as intuitive, I find. Files. Oh, files. Ah, there we go. Documents. Okay. New. Upload. Upload. I created a folder called Sasha's Test Document. Ha, Never quite you. got there. Files. <laughs> Test local file. That's my doc file. Now, here it hasn't removed the docx extension. It's still docx. Okay. Back at Google, let's double click on that file. And it has opened that in my online editor called Google Docs. It also has Google Sheets for spreadsheets and it will accept any format that you throw at it. Uh, but here you are in Google Docs. You notice that it's no longer the serif font. Mm -hmm. It's changed it to something called normal text. Right. Oh, so yes. again, it's going to change the formatting of some files because it's supplementing fonts and things like that. Right. Right. So if you've got checkboxes that are actually a checkbox image from a font, mm -hmm. it's probably not going to translate. Right. So we need to make sure that those are uh, transferable. But what's neat about doing it this way is now, moving forward, I always have them online. So if I send it to somebody, I'm sending them the Google Doc. Right. They can go in, they can open it, and, and it's always going to be the same because right. it's still in Google Docs in the cloud. Jump back over to Microsoft's product. And let's see how this one handles it. I'm going to double click on the file. Looked like it was going to take a single t single click. And there it is. Same thing. Now, it kept the font the same, which tells me that it's probably tying into my local fonts. So fonts that oh, are installed okay. on my computer itself, which definitely it looks like uh, that's what it's doing. That looks like kind of the default set for Linux or okay. for, for Microsoft Windows. I'm on Windows 10, pardon me. Um, so there you, there you have it. So it was able to open both. Now, where these products excel, Jeff, is file share. So now, Sasha, you want to be able to share this. And some yes. folks were joking, like, don't put information on here. Don't share this. It's not secure. Look at all the people who are going in and editing it. Well, I purposefully, during the demonstration, opened it up to the world right. and just let people at it. Right. Now, what you're going to do is, let's just say it, who is the email provider for your company? Is it Google? It is Google. It is Google. You go to Gmail yes, to open your email. That's true. Right? 
Do you use Gmail? Uh, I do. Yeah. yeah not so, for work, but yes. Okay. Well, in your instance, everybody in your office has access to a Gmail. Right. Because that's what they use. That's what, yes. So what you can do is you can just share it with your company. Exactly. Anyone at your company can open it at this file. Nobody else can. Right. That's how you can do it. So, and I can go as far as just setting up an email address if I wanted to go live at category5.tv. And then what do I want them to be able to do? They can edit, they can comment, or they can view. Mm -hmm. This is Google Docs. So with that, I can set up those permissions the way that right. I want them. Jumping over to um, the Microsoft product, how do we share here? I know that it's going to be available. There it is. Share. Share with people. No, I want to share with aliens. <laughs> Come on now, live at category5.tv. What does it say? Recipients can edit. Recipients can only view. Okay. Ah, Recipients yes. don't need a Microsoft account. Recipients need to sign in with a mm. Microsoft account. So presumably that means that you could send it without the need for them to sign in. Mm -hmm. So that's an added level of kind of... Um, uh, that's an added level of authentication to ensure that they are who they say they are. Right. Mm -hmm. Because y y if someone else got a hold of the link, they wouldn't be able to open it. Right. right. So that's pretty cool. So I think both products could achieve what we want to do. Yes. Now, maybe this isn't for this demonstration, but what about loading an ODT? How does Word Online show it? How would it work with an ODT? So this is the default format. For so that. basically the question is, is there cross compatibility between the products? Right, because sometimes, you know, I might be sending an ODT to somebody, right. and they don't have LibreOffice, uh -huh. and is it going to load properly? So can I just take the same file, and I'm going to change this to an ODF text document, which is ODT file extension, and I'm going to save this as Libre, just so that I have a distinction between them. Jump over here. Let's jump back to Google Drive and upload. Grab my LibreOffice. So this just demonstrates if they are compatible cross-program. Mm -hmm. right. So does Google Drive recognize ODT files? There's the Libre one. And that opened just fine. Yep. Now, interestingly enough, you can go File, Download As... So now if you need to actually send it to someone who doesn't have an internet account or something okay. like that, right. you can download it as DocX or what? ODT right. or rich PDF? type. You can do PDF. Yeah. Yep. Cool. So you don't have to buy like a PDF program. Plain text and zipped, HTML, EPUB. Um, over to the Microsoft product. Let's try the same test. Upload files and grab that file. That's the Libre ODT file and open. And there it is. Open okay. it. And again, single click on, uh, on the Word Online. And it looks oh. the same. Now, it warns, though, ODT documents, some compatibility issues could occur if you edit this document. Details. And it'll uh. go into some details. That's their way of saying, Word format's better. <laughs> Are you <laughs> sure? <laughs> Word's better than ODT. Right. That's just... It's funny. That's silly. But that's a Microsoft thing. That is. That's yeah. like... Okay. I was, I was doing some schoolwork over the weekend with a one of my classmates where she asked me to edit some of her work mm -hmm. and so she works in word mm -hmm. and i work in google docs and so i oh. so i could open it and it looked wonky but i knew like i wasn't editing her formatting okay, i knew yeah. like the wording was correct mm -hmm. right? right so then i sent it back to her she's like i don't like the way your stuff looks <laughs> <laughs> huh. well then so imagine this now so pick your base yeah. and say okay I, I, you're already a google user so use google docs exactly uh, which is google drive drive.google.com is where you want to go to mm -hmm. sign in mm -hmm. Um, if you're not a Google user, if you're really a Microsoft Office lover, um, then maybe the Microsoft Online is the way to go. Right. Yes. But both seem to offer similar functionality, um, and they give that collaborative um, mm -hmm. nature. So my thought is, Sasha, so yeah, there's a little initial hurdle where some files, if you upload them, they may need to be reformatted. But once they are, now they are in the Google Docs format or the... Uh, Microsoft Office online format, and you know that it's going to be compatible. Right. Uh, so that when someone else opens it, it's going to look the same on their computer. Excellent. So That's I just need to idea. do a couple of minutes work just 
do yeah. some more. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. I think that'll work really well. Perfect. This is Category 5 Technology TV. Thanks, everybody, for joining us today. Uh, are you folks ready to get into some GPIO coding? Yeah, yeah. We love Raspberry Pi. Yes, we do. You and I have worked a little bit with the uh, DigiSpark. Mm -hmm. Remember when we made a light light up using Arduino type yeah. of, uh, coding? I think I was here that week. You weren't here. I wasn't? No. I remember you doing you something. You probably with the watch it on repeat. I remember something where you use the Arduino. It was awesome. It was yeah, awesome. I don't know what it was then. I thought <clears> it was the light. Maybe you were here. Maybe I was. Maybe you were. <laughs> wow. Anyhow. I live vicariously through you guys. So whatever. <laughs> <laughs> You remember. Uh, I do remember. Absolutely. I was definitely here. She was really yes. impressed with my work. <laughs> now, one thing that I did during that demonstration is I did a little bit of soldering. Yes. We're going to avoid that tonight, folks. Yay. I oh, contemplated it. I, I got out a GPIO and a Raspberry Pi Zero, and I thought about it, and I thought, no. I'm going to breadboard it. So there we have it. I've got a really, really simple breadboard set up. I'm going to tell you exactly what we need for today's project. And before I do, I'm going to tell you what this is going to do. Okay. We're going to create something tonight that is going to light a light uh -huh. whenever Category 5 Technology TV is live on the air. Ooh. Ooh, okay. And when we sign off, it's going to turn off the light. Yes. You can place this device anywhere in the world as long as it has an internet connection. You're oh. going to build it yourself. And we're going to do it with a Raspberry Pi and a couple and of little And it will tell you when we're live. It's going to tell you when we're live. So I'm going to jump over here. I've got a little bit of walking to do, so talk amongst yourselves while I get over here. This is great. I this is like this what is we is need. a great reminder. Okay. Yes. It's this is like, what we need. We need Now, there's a Raspberry Pi in behind here with uh, Ethernet cable plugged into it. I've got the T-Cobbler. This is a, an optional component, but it really, really helps to be able to connect everything together. And it shows you the pin assignments, which are really, really helpful. We're going to need one LED. We're going to need a 330-ohm resistor. Can you folks see that there? Yep. And uh, then we're going to need a couple of cables to wire it all together. Very, very simple circuit. And you can see how I've wired this. So... First of all, the LED, um, so just note that the longer leg is going to be your positive. So that's going to go into pin 18, which is 3.3 volts. All right, so that is, is, I've already connected everything together just for the sake of the show. Um, so the longer pin is going into pin 18. And then the shorter end of the LED, which is the negative, uh, also called the, uh, the cathode, um, that is going to go to the lane that has the resistor. So what the resistor is going to do and it's focusing on my hand rather than the, uh, that doesn't really work very well. Um, so what this is going to do, let's grab a screwdriver here. So the resistor is going to prevent too much power from coming back along the negative cable into the ground. And that's going to prevent the Raspberry Pi from getting overloaded. If you leave out the resistor, there is a potential chance that if the bulb blew or if there was too much voltage going into the bulb, it could feed back into the ground and damage your Raspberry Pi. So that resistor is just going to help protect you. So a very, very simple circuit. We've got pin 18 coming off the T-cobbler, which is plugged into a Raspberry Pi 3, We're going to the uh, long end of an LED. Then the short end is going to a 330 ohm resistor out to the ground of the Raspberry Pi. Okay. So far... That's so far, so good? So far, so good. Right. Makes so sense. So, notice, no soldering involved. Prototyping today. Yes. Just so that you can see how it's done. You can solder it. You can put it into a nice little case. Do whatever you want. We're using an LED. You could use a relay. Right. In place of the LED. Get a 3.3 volt relay. And then you can trip a 110 breaker. And turn on a, a big sign. <laughs> Ooh, a Live strobe now. light. <laughs> Strobing the cat fire yeah. on the air. Whatever you want to do. Um, okay, first thing we need to do on our Raspberry Pi. Now, I've already done this, but I want to show you just because it is necessary. We need to install a program called Git, and Git is going to allow us to ins uh, download repositories, and we're going to need that functionality. apt install git. And you might want to do an apt update first. You can see Git is already the newest version on my computer, and that's exactly what we're looking for. Um, this is a, uh, a clean vanilla Raspbian uh, light um, installation. So okay. I just installed this on a Raspberry Pi 3 Model B. 
Okay, so um, next I need a, an application that will allow me to communicate easily with the GPIO. Mm -hmm. I don't want to get into creating registers and making all kinds of crazy stuff. There's, there are tools that are out there that make it a lot easier to communicate yep. with that general purpose input output um, of the Raspberry Pi, which are all those pins. So, just, so you've yeah. got... 40 pins, right? Yeah. You can plug into those and do all kinds of things. We can program what we want to do with them. Right. This is like the most basic thing, but we're going to be tying it into our API. So it makes it a little bit more exciting. Um, so the tool that we're going to use, I'm just going to go into my temp folder, which resets, uh, removes everything that I put in here after a reboot. So it's a good spot to do this. Git clone. So remember, I installed Git. And I'm also super user. I have to be root for these uh, for these things. So if you're not already root, the way to do that is sudo su. All right, sudo su, and then cd slash temp. Why do you have to be root? You have to be able to access the hardware GPIO. Mm -hmm. You have to be able to access the, um, the folders um, like user local bin. Um, you don't want permissions issues. But it, it pr particularly, you need to be able to access the GPIO, which requires root access. So we're going to get clone and then we want to grab this tool called wiring pi which we're going to get from git colon slash slash uh, and remember I'm going to put all the uh, these commands in the uh, notes below dragon.net not dragon.net and then slash wiring and be mindful it's a capital P on pi wiring pi Destination path, wiring pi already exists. Oh, apparently I already tested this. <laughs> I'm going to remove it just so that I can show you from scratch. Okay. So, try that again. Oh, there we go. Okay, so now CD wiring pi with a capital P, or I just type WI and then hit tab, and you'll see a couple of files here. But we need to build this, so we just go dot slash build, enter. And you wait. And you wait. And assuming you are not on a Raspberry Pi Zero, it will happen quite quickly. <laughs> now, if you type GPIO, you'll see that it actually gives output. It, I don't have to be in that folder. I can be anywhere. GPIO, and it gives output. Okay? So now, I can actually start utilizing those GPIO connectors on my Raspberry Pi, right. which are connected to a T-cobbler. Again, it's just a convenience thing. You don't have to have a T-cobbler. You can solder things to your Raspberry Pi, but this is just a really easy way to prototype. So the first thing I need to do, because all GPIO pins are input set when you first boot it, we need to set that GPIO, uh, which is, uh, you remember, do you remember what number we plugged it into? You can see it if you're uh, looking on the oh, screen there. Oh, was, my. Was it 13? Number 18. 18. Number 18 is 3.3 volts output when it is enabled, uh, or they call that high. Okay? So on pin 18, I have to change that from input to output. So I go GPIO-G mode 18. That's the pin number. Output. Enter. Now my GPIO pin is an output pin instead of an input pin. Now I want to turn on the light just to test it because I want to make sure that it's working and sure. I've wired everything correctly. So GPIO dash G write pin 18 and we're going to put one. One sets it to high, aka on, aka 3.3 volts. Uh, it's going to be a little less because of that resistor. So now when I hit enter in three, two, one, Yay! Oh, it's on. There we go. Sweet. <laughs> now, similarly... Is that excite us? I know, right? <laughs> so similarly, I can remove that, zero, uh, that one and add a zero, and it will turn it off. Oh. Yes. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Aw, Jeff. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> Simple things, oh. folks. Simple things. <laughs> this is what happens when you take a week <laughs> off. So now you say... It's like, light bulb! Yeah. Ooh. <laughs> so now you say, well, what can we do with this? Well, Category 5 has a live API. It just responds with either a 0 or a 1. 0 if we're off the air, 1 if we are on the air. You'll find this at live.cat5.tv slash API slash real time. And you just pull that um, using wget, using curl, whatever you want. Um, so if I do that, so if I do wget https colon slash slash live.cat5.tv slash API slash real time, and then it gave me a file called real time. I'm going to cat that. And you see it's one. Do you see that? Mm -hmm. Yes. Maybe it would be easier if I did it this way. If I wget, and then instead, I'm going to output to the screen instead. So wget, um, 
I think it's dash Q dash O dash one. See the one, and then it says root? Mm hmm And echo, no, and, and, echo, quote, quote, that'll help. There, one. If we were off the air, it would be a zero, okay? So this command is going to tell us whether we're on or off the air. Now, incidentally, there's another helpful tool on our API called test. And it will automatically change between on the air and off the air without you having to do anything. See how it was one first and then it turned to a zero? Right. Every 30 seconds it changes. So that's a great way to be able to test our code before we move it over to real time so that we can see if everything is working. So I've created a repository for you. Let's go into home slash pi and let's go git clone https colon slash slash github.com slash cat5tv slash cat5tv dash live. We're going to clone that into our slash home slash pi folder. Now it's there. CD cat 5 tv dash live slash sh. And you're going to see a couple of little tools there that are going to be uh, very, very helpful for us. So in just a couple of moments time, we're going to learn how to tap into that API and turn on and off that light, depending whether or not we're on the air. So cool. Uh, stick around. Whether you shop on ThinkGeek, GearBest, B&H Photo Video, eBay, or Amazon, or even if you want a free trial of Audible, you'll find the best deals and support the shows we produce by simply visiting the shopping sites you already frequent by using the links on our website. Visit category5.tv slash partners for the full and ever-growing list and help us create more free content like this show. Thank you for shopping with our partners, and thank you for watching. Welcome back to Category 5 Technology TV. We are turning on the lights. Sort of. No, but that's what we're covering. We're, we're taking a look at a Raspberry Pi. We're using uh, the breadboard, and we're showing you how to use a little program from uh, from category five to turn the light on when we are live on the air and you know what it's really just a proof of concept yes because the whole idea behind this demonstration is just to get you excited about hey you know what i can actually do some things with this you could use grep and you could uh, find out if the school buses are canceled in your area right and oh. you can have a, a little light go red if the school buses are canceled. Get the kids excited every morning if the light is red. You know? <laughs> uh, you can do whatever you want to do. You can use all kinds of tools, and, and the, what you do is really up to you. And we're just working with one GPIO pin. I almost feel like this could be used as some sort of like a Pavlov's dog kind of situation. You know, just put lights around your house and randomly turn them on. It's like, oh, it's dinner time. Turn it off. Oh, it's dinner time. You know? <laughs> <laughs> next thing you know, you flick a light and it's like salivating. So <laughs> practical. That's right. So incredibly practical. Okay, so we mentioned about our API, and our API just tells you whether or not we are live, and it looks a little something like that. So we're off the air, zero. See how it returns a zero? I'm using the test API, see? So if I keep running that, it's eventually going to change to a 1. Right, because it switches every 30 seconds. Yeah. And I see that some of it gets cut off there on your screen. Don't worry about it. Um, you can see what that, uh, as it scrolls up. Oh, it's taking a little longer. 1, we are on the air. The light didn't turn on. That's because we haven't coded it to yet, Jeff. Oh, <laughs> I just want to see the light. G-P-I-O, <laughs> right, number 18, 1. There you go, Jeff. Yes. There you go. There you are. Okay, so that's the thing. We want to, okay, first of all, we need to create some kind of intelligence to say, to create a loop and say, are we live or are we not live? I almost feel like there was a slam on me because I want to see the light. We need to create some sort of intelligence. <laughs> so here's the simple tool that I just whipped up for you. You can see that it's got both the APIs. We've got the test API that toggles every 30 seconds, and we've got the real-time API. Uh, then we've got a quick loop, and here's what we're doing. Now, we've already learned some of these things. So, we're setting the live variable in Bosch using wget and then whichever API we're using, and then we're outputting the response of that rather than downloading a file, okay? So, live is going to become either a 0 or a 1. 
If live is zero, say we're off the air. If live is one, say we're on the air. And if it doesn't know either way, if it's not a zero or a one, it will say unknown and, lo and then it will output whatever it output. Maybe my server's offline or something like that. Then it will sleep for 10 seconds, which means the loop is going to wait 10 seconds before going again. And the first thing it does when it restarts the loop at do is it reloads the API to check what the status is. So if I run this code, we can see we're off the air. No, we're not. This is the test API, right? right? Uh, and it's going to keep checking every 10 seconds. We know that the API is going to change. The test API changes every 30 seconds. So the most we're going to see is three off the airs and three on the airs, and that's going to loop. Right. Okay. And so when you've got something like this, it, I mean, could you use something other than a light? Could you have like a little bell that dings, or could you, sure you, could. Could you program like your... Alexa to say, Cat5 is on the air, or something like that? You could do any number of things. Now you see we're on the air, because 30 seconds have gone by, and so it's on the air. Right. Um, as I mentioned, you could use a relay in place of an LED. A relay will take a small voltage, like 3.3 volts, and allow you to use up to 210 volts, or something like that. Right. Okay. So you can, you can have a 3.3 volt trigger flip the relay, which connects the connectors for the 110, okay. and then turns on whatever you want. Um, okay. Or, you know, that's the GPIO scenario anyway, so you can really do anything. As far as con communicating with Alexa, that's a whole other thing. That's not something that we're doing here with GPIO. No, fair That's enough. certainly just, not something we do with GPIO. I didn't GPIO. know if the program would, like, if you programmed it to, that it would go that far. You could make it do any number of things, but all this does is it gives a 3.3 volt signal or it turns off the 3.3 volt signal. Okay. And LED is the most simple way to demonstrate that that is actually taking place. Right. Yeah. Okay. But I think a relay really opens it up to new possibilities. So now we see that that loop is happening. We're off the air. We're on the air because it's the test API. Now, if I switch that instead to the actual real-time API, so comment out the test API and run that, we're going to see that every time it's going to say that we are on air. Because right now we're broadcasting, so we are, in fact, on air. So right. that's what it's going to output. So I've created a second tool, which just takes that to the next step. So Again, it uses everything that I've already demonstrated and shown you here to be able to do um, what we want, which is inevitably turn on the light, turn off the light, depending mm -hmm. on whether or not we're on the air. So I've set the GPIO pin as a string so that you can change that if you want to a different GPIO pin. I've set that to pin 18. Then I'm saying if the GPIO executable exists in user local bin, then we can continue. If not, it's going to warn us you haven't in installed wiring pi yet. Okay? Because remember, that was one of the first things we had to do. Right. Then we need to set the pin for output. We already demonstrated that, but we're using the string. Instead of having to put 18, we're using dollar sign pin. So that is now an output pin at the beginning. Notice there's no loop yet. Okay? Because we don't need to turn it output, 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 over and over again. Now, clear the light state. If it is on, we're going to turn it off the first, of the first run. Uh, and then, and we already learned that command as well, then we start our loop. And this is exactly the same as the loop that we just looked at, mm -hmm. except for one thing, and that is that I've added the GPIO statement. So we grab the API from the, whichever API is selected, then we see whether it is zero, in which case we say off the air, but then we also turn off the light. Okay. Right? We're writing to the pin, 18, 0. If it's live, so 1, we say on the air to the terminal, and then we take pin 18, dollar sign pin, and we set it to 1. Simple enough. Okay, then we sleep for 10 seconds. Now, let's see what happens. So you see on the screen, I'm going to run that, gpio.sh, enter. Oh, the light's on. Because <laughs> we're, we're on the air. So now, remember, we're using the test API. So every 30 seconds, this is going to turn on or off the air. It's going to respond with either a 1 or a 0 every 30 seconds. So right now, we're on the air. So the device that you've created now, the light is on. Right. You know, oh, it's time for Category 5, time to make the popcorn, <laughs> or whatever it is no, that you have to use. The time to make use. popcorn has passed. You need to get to your feed. Wait for it. Wait for it. Oh, we're yes. going to go off the air now. <gasps> no, we're not. Yeah. I don't want to go off the air. Here it goes. Oh, there it goes. That would be a Did great way to end the show. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> go. Zoom. There you go. So that's uh, as simple as it is. R really, really simple programming. Really, really simple circuit. You can build something like that, and it takes you 10 minutes, realistically. Sure. Take my code. 
study it. I mean, it's really, really simple. I just whipped that up before the show just to be able to demonstrate it for you without making too many mistakes here on the air while we're live. And, uh, and it works great. And it could be used for so many different things. I like so. it. Cool. You know, I, I mean, I'm, I'm truly sitting there going, I'm picturing like building a house and wiring lights all over the place that run off a of Raspberry Pi. Why not? Yeah. So, you know, so you could be in the kitchen, you toggle a switch, <laughs> it's like, ooh, dinner's on, or, you know, all that kind of stuff so yeah. that all the bedrooms just have this little light that goes off and they could be, kids could be doing homework and they're like, oh, dinner's ready. Exactly. So this is where we need to tell you about voltage and you know well you, yes you don't want to pull too many volts off of the raspberry pi right. you're gonna Fair need you can't you can't hook it up to your microwave to pop the popcorn no <laughs> no, no. <laughs> but with a relay again yes. you can then use like a four amp power supply plug that into the relay then yep. plug the relay into the 3.3 <gasps> volt right uh, uh a gpio and you can have the relay trip to trigger a 12 volt four amp circuit right exactly and it does whatever you need. Dennis Kelly asks, and I think I know the answer to this. Mm. So is there a way to make it come on 15 minutes before the show? The truth of the matter is we kind of go live a couple minutes before the show anyway, right? We do. Yeah. So it would be fine. So you what's interesting yeah. about this yeah. is the moment I push live on Telestream Wirecast, our server database creates a variable in our server. It's a session variable that says we're live. Yes. Right. So it automatically creates all the feeds and puts everything up and, and mm -hmm. does all that and, and does everything that happens. Yeah, I get a little pop-up on my screen. There see? you go. Right. Ding, so we're live. what you will get in that moment is the light will come on, not, not when we start, hey, welcome to Category 5. No, as soon as we push that we're live button and we're streaming to the web, it's usually about 15 minutes before the show, okay. that's going to happen. Mm -hmm. So try the circuit. And if you try this simple, simple circuit and the simple software that I've provided for you to get started, uh, we'd love to see your pictures. We'd love to hear from you and know how it's worked out. Um, and make sure that you've got it near the TV uh, next time you're watching Category 5 TV when you're watching live. And if you're not familiar with our live schedule, it's every Wednesday night at 7 o'clock Eastern Time. That's when we are actually broadcasting live. If you're watching it elsewhere, you may be watching like a recording or, or something. Right. Else, exactly. So. All right. Fun. Yeah, I love it. Are you all set, ready to head over to the newsroom? I am. Okay. Here are the stories we're covering this week in the Category 5.tv newsroom. Research suggests thousands of websites are being hit by cyber, cyber thieves who implant code to scoop up payment card numbers. The no-fly zone for drones around airports is to be extended following the disruption at Gatwick in December. A wake-up call as Quadriga's founder takes $135 million of their customers' cryptocurrency to the grave. And a new AI is able to generate free freakishly realistic people who don't actually exist. These stories are coming right up. Don't go anywhere. This is the Category 5.TV Newsroom, covering the week's top tech stories with a slight Linux bias. Jeff Weston. Yaman. Yeah, you're building a brand new beautiful website. What? Aren't you? No. Am I? Oh, you're a terrible actor. What? This is where acting comes into play. Oh, I didn't know we were acting. You're supposed to act. Okay, fair enough. All right. yeah, I'm building a really cool website. Are you building a really cool website? Just because Jeff is confused doesn't mean you have to be. Visit cat5.tv slash dreamhost to sign up for unlimited web hosting for your website with unlimited email accounts, MySQL databases, the latest version of PHP, WordPress, and more, and even a free domain name registration. It's less than $6 per month, so sign up today. cat5.tv slash dreamhost. I'm Sasha Rickman, and here are the top stories we're following this week. Research suggests thousands of websites are being hit by cyber thieves who implant code to scoop up payment card numbers. Security giant Symantec found more than 4,800 websites were being hit by these form jacking attacks every month. High profile victims of these attacks include British Airways and Ticketmaster. According to Orla Cox, director of Symantec's security response unit, formerly profitable ventures involving ransomware and mining cryptocurrencies now made gangs much less money, so th they have instead turned to inserting attack code either when sites fail to update core software to close loopholes or via insecure third-party apps. 
apps such as chat apps, analytics packages, or other extras. It's a tiny line of code in there and that's enough for attackers to monitor payment card info being entered in as they siphon it off. Cox goes on to say, quote, it's not obvious that the website has been compromised. To the naked eye, everything would look fine, end quote. Hmm. So. I feel like this is just a digital version of those, uh, card the readery. faces that they put on the like ATMs the and stuff. Or they do reader. it in like the gas yeah. pumps. Yes. That was a big thing. This yeah. is such an yeah. easy thing to accomplish sure. from a coding standpoint. And I hope that people understand that. That if you launch, like, if you launch a WordPress blog, and then you install a whole bunch of plugins that sound cool, yeah. this happens. I'm just going to give you a scenario. So, oh, th this is a really cool slider that right. makes my images slide like a nice slideshow. Right. Just to, oh, it looks and cool, money. and it's free. <laughs> okay? Re remember that. So then what happens is some malicious party finds these really cool sliders that are free yeah. and says, hey, I'll give you uh, $1,000 to sell me that program so that it can now be my program that I, I'll maintain it. I will take over the project. Mm -hmm. right. It's like little small business transactions of like coders who I developed a really cool plugin for WordPress. And wow, somebody mom, wants to pay me for it. somebody wants yeah. to pay me a thousand bucks for the program that I, I made in my bedroom. Yeah. Hot quite quite possibly, there we right? Go. That's, that's a very legitimate scenario. So then this party who has now purchased it injects code into the plugin. Then they upload that to the repository. Mm -hmm. WordPress, which you have installed with that plugin, now says, oh, there's an update. Install updates, because we know right. to install our updates, right? Mm. So now this code is injected into our website, our WordPress website, just to use that as the example. This is why WordPress websites, you, you hear about a lot of them getting compromised. Yeah. Right. And then people start to say, oh, well, WordPress is not safe. No, it's, it's the practice of the administrators that is not safe. Right. I have folks who say to me, uh, I want administrator access to my WordPress site. And I say, why do you want that? Sure. Oh, well, because I want to be able to have control over my site if your business goes under. Or whatever. Right. Hold on one second. How much do you know? And what is it you're going to be putting in? Like, you have to be realistic here. You've got to understand the risks. It's not a WordPress problem. It's a user problem. I'm not going to give you administrator access. You can take that hosting elsewhere kind of thing yeah. because it's just too dangerous for you. Um, and that's why our local church website got hacked and turned into an ISIS website. Yes, I remember that. This happens because they are clueless about security and yet they're, and they're trying to save a buck and so we've yeah. installed WordPress and somebody who doesn't actually understand security is the one who's administering it. Right. Mm -hmm. That's the risk. So, so now this plugin is installed and we're doing sales on our website or we've got, we're collecting contact information, emails and things like that. And all they're doing is transparently, you don't even know what's happening. If someone enters their credit card number, it's sending a copy to you for the payment and it's sending a copy to the malicious party as well. Right. That's it. You don't even know what's happening. Now, would yeah. using third-party services like, say, Dashlane or something where you can have your payment, you know, cards in your program and then it automatically fills it in, would that be more secure or does the form still read that information? It's not, it's not at all. That's not this problem. Okay. Right. All right. This is form injection. So this is taking a form that is being submitted on a website, mm -hmm. collecting the data before it sends it to the actual processor. Right. Okay. So your question was, it, does it help if I, as the administrator, well, let's say I use oh. PayPal as my payment processor, right. uh, as the administrator I allow, maybe I'm, I use Moneris and you know, I'm, sure. I'm a big business. Well, right. it doesn't matter because that information has to be transmitted to Moneris right. in order to get the, the charge Mm -hmm. to happen, right. and then it comes back with a, yeah, it passed, or no, it was declined. Now, in that case, though, maybe it's a different, it's a different process, because it's like OAuth, and, yeah. and the, okay. the transaction details are never exposed. PayPal, same thing. You don't actually get my credit card number if you That's right. process my transaction with PayPal, right. so it's a different thing. However, they could, uh, they could receive my PayPal user credentials 
Oh, okay. theoretically, right? Because it's on a form. Because it's being because it's being transmitted through the form. Right. They wouldn't get my credit card number, so it's a little bit of a different scenario. But still. But any data that's transmitted can be intercepted by these types of infiltrations. And part of it is that we've learned that a site needs to be secure. So the injection has to occur on the actual server. It can't occur out in, on some other server that's been compromised and then, hey, it's communicating back and forth. No, it has to happen on the actual server that's hosting the website because that's the security certificate. So it happens completely transparently. Oi. Back to paper forms. So be careful. That's right. <laughs> well, I think it boils down to um, you know what what I've been saying on the. Uh, it's come up a couple of times on our new uh, EndpointSecurity.ca yes. podcast, where uh, Tony Anscom and even uh, Stephen Cobb had reiterated that uh, we need to be very mindful. And Tony really talked about this um, that when we are shopping online, as an example. We need to know that we trust the people that we are purchasing from, especially if we're going to be saving our data for the next transaction. That's right. yes. So Amazon memorizes my credit card because I'm shopping there all the time. I don't want to have to enter it every time. Mm -hmm. But another store where I maybe shop once a year, twice a year, I don't need to have them memorize my credit card number because I'm only opening myself up to be exploited That's if right. they uh, come under compromise. Mm -hmm. right. So just be mindful of all these things. We've learned so much in this moment of news. <laughs> <laughs> On to the next moment. Yes. <laughs> the no-fly zone for drones around airports is to be extended following the disruption at Gatwick in December. From March 13th onward, it will be legal to fly a drone within three miles of an airport rather than the current 0 0.6 mile exclusion zone. The government also said it wants police to have new stop and search powers to tackle drone misuse. Gatwick Airport was shut down for more than a day due to drone sightings near the runway. It caused chaos for travelers, affecting more than 1,000 flights and about 140,000 passengers. Wow. Since then, airports have been trying to improve their procedures to detect drones, but they continue to see illegal flights near their perimeters. In January, departures at Heathrow were temporarily stopped after a drone was reportedly sighted. Transport Secretary Chris Grayling said, quote, the law is clear that flying a drone near an airport is a serious criminal act. He continues, we are now going even further and extending the no-fly zone to help keep our airports secure and our skies safe. Anyone flying their drone within the vicinity of an airport should know that they are not only acting irresponsibly, but criminally and could face imprisonment, end quote. Hmm. Uh, I have no issue with this. This makes sense. No, to no, me. absolutely. Well, uh, three miles is a lot of distance, though, and well, it is. But when it's a shame that they've had to take this step. But I mean, you figure how high drones can go, and if you've got a yeah. major plane mm -hmm. that's coming in, I mean, that trajectory is not. It's not like they're you know helicopter yeah. drop. Oh I yeah, mean, mm -hmm. they're coming in and to go three miles out. Mm -hmm. You're gonna need it. Right. You know, so I, I have no issue with this. I think it's good. And, and it's unfortunate that people are so careless. I think it boils down to the people. The, the, the only reason that I have a little bit of a different view is that my sister used to live fairly close, within three miles of an airport. Nowhere near the fly zone. Mm -hmm. Like there were no airplanes going right over her house mm -hmm. or anything. But I used to fly around the field in her, in her yard because she had a big yard. And, right. I, and I thought... Well, that's within three miles of the airport, so you would not be able to fly in your field here mm -hmm. because it's a no-fly zone at this point. So there's kind of two sides to it, but people need to be smart. I remember when we heard about these drones a long time ago, I yeah. had the idea, why don't they come up with some sort of scrambler or something that would just knock it out well, of the sky? Well, the then airplane you said out of the sky. It would knock the airplane out of the sky. Well, <laughs> would this distance be far enough away from the planes that you could knock the drones out of the sky? That's the question. <laughs> uh, 747, uh, you need to get about 10 feet higher, otherwise you're going to hit the wall. Uh, I don't know. No, I just part feel of like... the issue, I think, is, is the fact that, I mean, you've got drone makers from all over the world, and at the end of the day, they're not regulated on how they make them. So it's not mm -hmm. like you could say, based on regulations, you have to put you know, this script within there. There you know, are. My drone cannot fly above, the, like, to the, to the no-fly limit. Right. The GPS okay. signal will will stop it. It's like it's like hitting a wall. It's an amazing feeling. As soon as great. you get there, the drone just is like, and it just stops. Right. 
you can't go any higher. And all you can do is bring it down about 50 feet and then fly. That's it. So, but yours has that program. Not it all does. Do. And as soon as you enforce that in every drone, people are going to be snipping the wire. Right. That's exactly what you know people, is going to happen. Yeah, e-bikes are, came out. E-bikes came out, and people started removing the governors. Yes. <laughs> people are boundary pushers by nature. So yeah. Yeah. this is this is why it becomes a criminal offense now instead mm -hmm. of just, hey, we had a policy. Now well, it's like. And, it's, but they can never find the individuals. Right. Again. I mean, uh, man, we have some really good information on the endpointsecurity.ca podcast. <laughs> because Stephen Cobb was saying, that, you know, part of the issue with cybercrime is people know that they are probably not going to get caught. Right. How is a Russian hacker in, on Russian soil going to get caught when he's hacking uh, a, an American server? It's not going to happen. And even if he's caught, he's not going to be arrested or anything. Right. It's not going to happen unless he leaves the country. Mm -hmm. So similarly, like, I mean, well, a drone, I mean, they still haven't fi found the person or persons responsible no, for shutting down the airport. And they won't. And they won't. No. They put up a 50,000 pound reward for anyone with information and nobody's come for Nobody has that information because it's just a drone flying around. How close do you have to be to the drone in order to fly it? Like, could you not remote into oh, your kilometer, remote? a kilometer? couple but kilometers? Could you remote into your remote to fly your drone? You could you be to. like one step? These days you can use, move. you can just use a headset and you can fly it as far yeah. as you yeah. want. And yeah. As long as it's within range, a couple kilometers or so. Yeah. Um, but then you can see from the camera. Used to be the issue for planes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That'll be drones with laser pointers. It was Christmas lights just a couple of moment, uh, a couple of months ago. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> A wake-up call as Quadriga's founder takes 135 million of their customers' cryptocurrency to the grave. When the 30-year-old founder of a Canadian cryptocurrency exchange died suddenly, he took around $180 million Canadian in cryptocurrency to his grave. Now tens of thousands of Quadriga CX users are wondering if they will ever see their funds again. Back in 2014, one of the world's biggest online cryptocurrency exchanges, Mt. Gox, unexpectedly shut down after losing 850,000 bitcoins valued at the time at nearly $0.4 billion. Its meltdown shook investors in the volatile emerging marketplace, but the calamity at the Tokyo-based company proved a boon for a new Canadian online cryptocurrency exchange. Quadriga CX founder Gerald Cotton said at the time, people like the fact that we're located in Canada and know where their money is going. Some five years later, Cotton's sudden, untimely death has left thousands of his customers scrambling for information about their own missing funds. This month, Quadriga, which had grown to become Canada's largest cryptocurrency exchange, was granted temporary bankruptcy protection in a Canadian court. The firm said it had spent the week since Cotton's death trying desperately to locate and secure their cryptocurrency reserves. In court documents, Quadriga says it owes up to 115000 an estimated $250 million Canadian, about $70 million in hard currency, and about 180 and $190 million in cryptocurrency based on recent market rates. It believes, though it is not certain, that the bulk of those millions in reserves was locked away by cotton in cold storage, which is an offline safeguard against hacking and theft. For now, all has been all trading has been suspended on the platform. Yeah, I'll say. Yeah, of course. Hey, anybody want to trade on there? Ah, uh, no. <laughs> okay, so but if it's a if it's a registered exchange, now granted, mm. I don't know if it falls under the exchange rules as far as like the stock market goes, but it's a company. Would somebody not have had authoritative powers to take over all those accounts? It doesn't work well, that way. It's cryptocurrency. So he had the, it, presumably he had the, the, the keys. Yeah, he had the private keys. keys. Right, but then who gets access to his estate? Like this is, this should he be. He was 30. So he didn't think of that, I bet. Yeah, maybe. He was 30. We'll know in the next couple of months. He was months. a Canadian 30 we'll year old. I feel it. like yeah, he see, probably thought he had another 50 years easy. Mm -hmm. But I've, I mean, like, I. Just starting up. I yeah. would think if you're going to have a company that at one point had $0.4 billion in, in cryptocurrency, you would have some sort of lawyer and backing behind you and some sort of... 
if you framework? had a friend named Jeff at the time when you were starting that, you might have <laughs> thought of that. But if you were just a guy that was taking advantage of the fact that he had a great idea and that the other, you know, Tokyo-based company had problems, then you just have an problems. idea, you run with it. And then all of a sudden, you meet an untimely end and your people now are scrambling, probably trying every cold storage area in Canada. But I yeah. feel like it's got to well, be no, it's not a it's not a physical space, oh. Sasha. Oh. This is cold storage crypto. Yeah. Oh. So this means without, you mean he without doesn't the keys? Have, in my mind, it's like that time when that computer ended up in the dump. Remember that, yeah, I mean, right? So I sure. pictured that it was that hard... Let's... Okay. Let's let's use this as an example. Okay. So we've got a DT2000 from Kingston. Yes. It has a passcode key lock. Yes. I set the password on this right. and I put all my files on this. Pretend that these files are the cryptocurrency keys right. for thousands of customers. Mm -hmm. Okay. So this basically is the access to their money. Without this, you cannot gain access to that money. Right. Now you can punch in your code. You can try to guess my code 10 times and then it wipes itself. Right. Everything's gone from this drive. Right. Okay. <sighs> he had the keys. Yeah. And he died mm. unexpectedly. So yes. he didn't, he, he made a stupid decision, I'm sure. Yeah. It wasn't intentional to take anybody's money. N no, he thought he was being wise to get it into cold storage, which is right. to make it Secure. inaccessible yeah. by hackers. And it's, it's a tough call because if you're going to trade in cryptocurrency, you need to have your own cold storage. You need to have your own. They call it an offline wallet. It's a wallet that is not accessible by anyone other than you. Right. Keep your keys somewhere safe. I've got them on paper. And there you go. Not and on paper, your wife can find them if something happened to That's you. Right. Cryptocurrency isn't insured in any way, is it? Uh, yeah, like it's like the Canadian uh, banking system, it's right? Too, you have this, how do you prove? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. How do you prove your cryptocurrency if it went missing? It, you can't. It's impossible. That's the whole point. Mm -hmm. um, so it's just one of the so so because he is, because this is an exchange. It's different. Mm -hmm. This is not a bank. Mm -hmm. A bank you put your money in and you trust that your money's safe. Right. This is not that. This is an exchange. This is where I put my money in order to exchange it to other to cu other currencies yeah. to right. other to, right so you hear about the value of bitcoin and you think well how do you actually monetize that i can't walk into a store and buy something with bitcoin no so you put that bitcoin on an exchange convert it into ethereum convert it into litecoin and convert it into us dollars right hmm. But it has to enter the exchange in order to happen. Yeah. So that's why people put their currency in there. It's unfortunate. Unfortunately, some people leave their currency in there, not ever really making the wise decision to move it into a paper wallet or an it's, offline wallet. It it's truly is unfortunate. This yeah. Happened. Because at the end of the day, the, the idea is a great idea, but because the security and the succession planning wasn't thought out as a company, mm -hmm. people are now getting screwed. Unfortunately, big, big it's time. a really tough thing. Yeah, and if I have paper wallets, bad. like it's going to set a bad image for cryptocurrencies because people are like, "Oh, I lost my money." But at the end of the day, that's not the issue. The issue is this guy's. No, you wanted you wanted safe yeah. currency. You wanted a currency that cannot be traced. Right. So this is the side effect of that if something goes wrong. That's right. Mm -hmm. But the the really crummy thing is that you know people can't get that money back. Mm. It's a, it's a tragedy, really. Is there any way in to, so many ways to like re pull those trans transactions through the blockchain to rebuild it or through the blockchain? Through a blockchain, I mean. No, no. You have to have the keys. Right, 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 right. He uh, has and, the keys. And just to fi a final thought, not to be ominous or or anything, but you you think, okay, well, why don't you just have a paper wallet? Why didn't he ha he just have the keys printed and stored in a safe or something? And, and one of the things that's also happening with these kinds of folks, so the people who are responsible for Bitcoin mm -hmm. and, and, and other cryptocurrency exchanges, is that they are now targets. Sure. Because if I know that somebody has that kind of currency and it's untraceable, and I know that they store the keys in their vault instead of in their head. Then I then want in their vault. I want in right. their vault at all costs because as soon as I have those keys, I have all of that currency and there is no tracing that transaction. That's right. Ah. Oh. It's unfortunate. Yeah. Well, 
Let's move on to some lighter news. Yeah, okay. <laughs> a new AI is able to generate freakishly realistic people who don't actually exist. At first glance, they just look like average looking people. The catch is, none of them exist. All, you, all these faces that you're seeing are fakes, put together by artificial intelligence. To be more precise, these faces are created by a Generative adv Adversarial Network, or GAN, developed by NVIDIA using deep learning techniques to produce realistic portraits out of a database of existing photos. Head over to uh, thispersondoesnotexist.com to see for yourself. Every time you refresh the page, the network will generate a new facial image image from scratch. With again, new, two neural networks, neutral, neural as in designed to mimic the brain's decision making process, work in tandem. Here, one network generates a fake face while another decides if it's realistic enough by comparing it with photos of actual people. If the test isn't passed, the face generator tries again. This feedback loop is responsible for the images you can see here. Similar GANs have been used to switch a scene from winter to summer. NVIDIA's impressive face coding is now managing to add a new level of authenticity through what's known as style transfer, processing different parts of the image like face shape and hairstyle separately. It means different faces can be more easily and more realistically blended together in a similar sort of way that photo apps turn your face into a painting or a sketch. After training, the programmers can combine these aspects in any way they like. The weighting of these different facial aspects can be tweaked and adjusted as necessary, giving the programmers greater control over the end output. That is incredible. I know. It is freaky how realistic those faces are. They it's are. Have you seen derp fakes? Like, they can make faces look like they're saying stuff or singing or whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. So take, take this, blend it with that, and suddenly you've got actors that don't exist. Well, and that's it. I mean, when I first saw this, I was pulling it up and <laughs> my wife's like, what are you doing? Like, you're looking mm. at random people. Mm -mm. I'm like, they're not people. So use this as your avatar. Like, what? Use it's, these as your avatar. Well, it, yeah. Right. It, I well, except then Facebook is like, send me your picture to prove that it's you. Right. <laughs> <And> yeah. <laughs> now, I will say, though, not all of the pictures were great. There was a few that came through, and when I looked at them, I'm going, there's something odd about this. And, and I think it's oh, just sure. it's a matter of learning mm -hmm. to you know kind of figure it out. But in general, they looked really, really... A lot of them. A it, lot accurate, of them. yeah. Yep. It's true. It's like the, the little imperfections, like the smile lines around the eyes or the crooked teeth. It's like yep. those sorts of things that make you feel, okay, this is an authentic person, mm -hmm. not an AI-generated, perfect, symm symmetrical being. Like mm -hmm. nobody mm -hmm. is... It's incredible yeah. stuff. Yeah, it's, it's pretty awesome. wild. It's, but I mean, at the same time, it makes you go, now can I trust anybody's image online? <laughs> it's like, yeah. you know, <laughs> like, could you turn around and, and create, you know, a whole story about somebody and have pictures and create this fake, like, yes. you've got these fake Facebook profiles that oh, are man. all about stealing well, that's friendless one. and stuff. I'm <laughs> thinking about the real positive aspects of it, though. You're thinking that, he, oh, let's get, let's get all, yeah, let's get into the negative. No, think about this. A game in yeah. virtual reality with your headset. So yes. that is able to, upon launch, generate all of the characters that look like real people and everybody has never been seen before and they're not even real people. But they look incredibly real. Because the AI could take that and form it onto um, a model. Right. So now just add three dimensions to the photo. It's so and it super into, cool. And oh. then do it in v VR. And in yeah. VR, yeah. 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 Interact with these people. Oh. Um, you know, kids' games these days, they generate avatars upon sure. launch. And yeah. it's all, you know, it's a different avatar every time, but they're video game quality. Now cool. take it and take it to the next level, make them look really real. Now, That's I wonder, crazy. though, what would happen if somebody used that image and there happened to be a real physical... Your doppelganger? Yes. I was just thinking that. Like, what, <laughs> yeah. if I, what if Your I click AI it enough time and then all of a sudden it's like it looks like somebody who kind of looks like me or, you know? You'd have to yeah. hit refresh a lot like of times. That, yeah, but it would be freaky. That like, oh, yeah. like not only am I no longer like an individual, but I'm mm -hmm. like copied by mm -hmm. and it's an AI person, you know? Yeah. Well, see, then you just look and you go, am I really real? Huh. <laughs> let's, let's put together like a, a wanted poster. 
Sure. With like, and just every week change the photo to one of these automatically <laughs> Brand, NVIDIA yes. AI generated photos. <laughs> See how many calls you get. Or like awesome. employee of the month. Let's just do it as employee there of the month. There you go. Okay. Brilliant. We're going to put that up behind us <laughs> every <excellent>. week. <laughs> <laughs> oh, All right, let's get, uh, let's get over to CoinGecko. Here's what the crypto market looked like as of 1800 hours Eastern time on Wednesday, February 20th, 2019. Bitcoin is up, gaining $353.60 US, doing very well mm -hmm. at $3,958.86. Litecoin is also up, gaining about $10, just uh, $9.52 US at $51.10. Ethereum is also up, $146.94. Gained $25.37 since last week. Monero is rising slowly at 51.24. And the small guys have gone down just a little bit. Stellite is down at 1.59 ten thousandths of a cent. And TurtleCoin at 0 0.82. Remember that the cryptocurrency market never closes and is always volatile. Big thanks to Roy W. Nash and our community of viewers for submitting stories to us this week. Thanks for watching the Category5.tv newsroom. Don't forget to like and subscribe all, for all your tech news with a slight Linux bias. And for more free content, be sure to check out our website. From the Category5.tv newsroom, I'm Sasha Rickman. And I'm Robbie Ferguson. And I'm Jeff Weston. Thank you so much for being here with us again this week. Looking forward to next week. Same place, same time. See you then. Get your light to turn it on. That's right. <laughs>